Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up so numerous and, and waiting. I did not announce that we start like 15 minutes later all the time. Thanks a lot to the panelists, whom I'll introduce uh, uh, briefly in a, in a short time. Um, uh, before that, I wanted to say a few words, like how this event came into being or like uh, where the idea came from. And please be aware that we are filming. So in case everyone here on the panel later will agree and I decided it's a useful conversation, uh, it might go online. So just that you're aware, uh, because I can't ask you afterwards, uh, by hearing this, apparently you agree legally. So we'll be filming, which brings me to uh, thanks a lot to the Volksbühne for making all this possible. We have not so much time, so I will not uh, say thanks individually to, to individuals. Um, so the idea for this uh, No More Dick Soup was, um, or the, the, the procedure today is that um, there will be a short statement by, by Candice at the beginning, uh, um, uh, Bonaventura maybe as well, and then we try to join a, a conversation here. Uh, not too long, because I know that there are many of you here who are not, uh, didn't come just to listen, but also have interesting things to say. Um, so we'll open uh, up the floor like rather soon, at least that's the idea. Um, if not, don't be despair. This is a salon. We'll be, uh, it's, it's going to be open until nearly 11, and then we also usually go to the canteen of the Volksbühne. I'll, I'll announce that later. But so there's plenty of time to discuss, so it's not just what's happening here. Um, so about this, uh, um, about uh, tonight, I, I contacted Candice some weeks ago uh, um, via Facebook initially, or phone, I don't remember. And the idea was really to stick to the deliberately provocative title of this series and bring some um, uh, people together who have uh, very different opinions about um, the topic of, of today. Um, and not in order to have a kind of polemical fight here on stage, but rather to really like uh, address the topic in, in uh, to avoid the usual like everyone agreeing with each other and sharing experience uh, kind of a round table. Uh, I had a very positive conversation with her. Um, um, uh, also in the spirit of how such a conversation should uh, should take place uh, and uh, um, I like the, the formulation of um, getting um, out of the usual consciousness rising strategies in contemporary art or contemporary academia for that matter and instead move towards an actual transformation or ideas like how to uh, um, have actual transformations in, in the field of exhibition art but hopefully also beyond, I mean, even in this legendary theatre it's legendary for many things, but uh, has a very appalling uh, uh, history when it comes to uh, uh, minorities or like female directors and so on. So these are the things we, we obviously want to um, talk about today. Unfortunately, I did not succeed in, in bringing, so to say, members of, of the other party of uh, a different opinion here on stage for various reasons. But nevertheless, we decided to... Um, well, no, let's, uh, the, the idea is not to take down individuals today. I think it's, it's also not... Yeah, an, Yeah, I said, like, I try to invite, like, also others, but, like, for also logistic reasons and so on, which I don't want to go into details. Anyhow, uh, we nevertheless decided to go ahead because it's a very important topic um, and uh, even uh, thought in between. I mean, I said, like, do I even need to be on stage? Even offered myself of coming up with the, with the dirty questions uh, and so on. But anyhow, we decided I'm just a moderator today. So um, this is more or less it. Um, apart from introducing my guests, and I'm very happy... Uh, that they're here. Unfortunately, Iris uh, can't be with us tonight. Um, uh, but I, I start uh, with, uh, with Heba Amin. She's born in Cairo, um, uh, but lives and works in Berlin. She received a master's uh, master degree in New Media Art and Interactive Design at the University of Minnesota. She's a lecturer at the Bard College uh, and a doctorate fellow in art history at the uh, Free University here in uh, Berlin. Uh, in her work, she's particularly in, uh, interested uh, or investigating um, tactics of subversion and other techniques, uh, especially in uh, ha hacking like a TV series like Homeland, uh, which of course focuses on, on imaginal uh, voices. And I'm really interested what, what that means, this hacking for contemporary institutions, art institutions, cultural institutions. Uh, same interest, of course, with Bonaventura. Now, uh, the name thing, I tried to train it before, but uh, Bonaventura so Bejeng Nikung if that's okay, he's a curator. Of course, uh, all of you know him uh, for uh, the, the art space he found in 2009, Savvy, contemporary art, but uh, I did not know, but he also has, holds a PhD in biotechnology. I don't know what's more impressive, but uh, so these are the two things. I deliberately um, 
decided not to focus on all the artistic achievements and, and curatorial achievements, but really uh, uh, because we don't want to have an art discussion here, but more an institutional one. Um, then I come to uh, Grada Quilomba. She was born in, in Lisbon, um, with roots in, in West African islands, but also in Angola. Um, she's an interdisciplinary artist and, and, and writer. I asked her before, there's such a long list of things that she does, but she refused. She told me that not to mention all of them. Uh, so I just say she's an interdisciplinary artist and writer, uh, questions, working on questions of memory, gender, racism, uh, in, uh, even though I'm not sure whether she wants me to mention it. But in 2012, she was a visiting professor uh, for gender studies and post-colonial studies at the Humboldt in, in Berlin. We share, I think, uh, skepticism towards uh, academic discourse. Uh, uh, she's been uh, participating in many uh, biennials, Sao Paulo, Berlin Biennial, uh, and, and since 2050, maybe that's also important mentioning here, uh, she, she works at the Gorky Theatre. Last but not least, Candice Breitz. Um, when I said before my guests, I should have said her guests, our guests, somehow with her this evening wouldn't have been possible. So. Basically, she invited everyone. She's an artist who works primarily in, in video and photography. I'm sure you saw her exhibitions here in, in Berlin at the KW Gallery and, and other places. Um, she, she lives in Berlin. She has a tenured uh, a professorship at Braunschweig University since 2007 um, and also holds a degree from uh, the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. She's, she's South African uh, initially, um, and at the University of Chicago and uh, Columbia University. So I tried to make that really quick because anyhow, you, you know the people here, most of you do, uh, but nevertheless, um, I quickly wanted to uh, uh, introduce them. And uh, yeah, so the idea is now that, uh, Candice, you, you're giving a, a short like statement somehow to assess a bit the, the framework or the field of, of, of discussion, and then uh, yeah, Bonaventura is also going to uh, say a few things, and then we, we open up the discussion. That's your micro. <coughs> Well, thank you, Armin. Thank you very much for um, giving us the space this evening to continue a conversation which is not by any means a new conversation. It's a conversation that I think many of us in this room have had countless numbers of times over years and years and years. And one of the questions at the heart of this evening, which I hope we'll, we'll start to address, is how and whether it might be possible to move beyond um, some of the basic um, uh, some of the basic conversations that happen within this territory uh, and to transcend some of those conversations and, and think about ways in which our ideas um, about diversity could be collectively moved into action faster. This is the moment usually where someone in the audience says, but it used to be worse. It used to be much worse for women. It used to be much worse for people of color, yes. But it, there's, there's a long way to go. It needs to be much better. And um, I'm going to just start by, by framing for those of you, I'm not assuming that everybody has followed the, the most recent debate that led up to this evening. Uh, basically, an exhibition, another exhibition was planned, which was almost uh, completely exclusive of uh, women. It was a group <laughs> exhibition of, of 12 uh, men, and, well, 11 men and one woman, no artists of color. And I don't think we need to talk about that exhibition or that institution or that curator. I think that we'll refer to that as a sort of very typical example of the curatorial practice that happens all the time. Um, there's no uh, there's no argument that this is is pretty conventional and pretty widespread practice. In response to that exhibition, a group of us very spontaneously got together and uh, drafted an open letter, which was designed to address not only that specific incident, but rather to use that incident as a way of opening up a larger conversation about why it is and how it is that institutions continue to perpetuate this kind of exclusionary practice. And I was not alone. Um, I was given far too much credit in this process. There were a group of us, many of whom are here this evening, working on that. And we managed, within a very short period of time, to collect over a 1,000 signatures, which on the one hand was gratifying because I think it testified to the sense of urgency which is in the air, <coughs> a sense of anger, a sense of rage, if I may say so for myself, a desire to see things finally shift beyond the symbolic, beyond the discursive, and into actual practice that, that can 
can significantly transform the way things happen in the cultural realm. So um, I'm going to read a short statement which um, is quite, uh, it's, it's more a desire to frame the issues of the evening and I've, I'll be doing so in as quick a way as possible because we didn't want to give formal presentations here this evening. But I do have a tendency to, to take up too much space and I thought if I wrote it down then I would be able to restrict myself. When we point to or critique the disproportionate amount of support and visibility that is typically granted to people who are white and male, we do so in fact to point to all the voices that are missing from our cultural present as a direct result of the inordinate, inordinate amount of support that is channeled towards the same small demographic again and again. How can we relate to ourselves and to others whose life experiences may be completely different from our own in complex and nuanced ways if our cultural institutions continue to insist on privileging the worldviews, perspectives, values, and achievements of one demographic over and over again, consistently, at the expense of other voices. Of course, the real question is, what do we lose when everything that we know about the world comes to us via books that are written largely you know, by white men, classes that are taught by white men, exhibitions that are curated by white men, lectures that are given by white men, works of art that are made by white men, newspaper columns that are written by white men, <coughs> principles that are delivered to us by juries that are composed of white men, laws that are drafted and set in motion and, and um, administered largely um, in the spirit of patriarchy. What can we really know about the world and how can we really have a complex relationship not only to those who are like us but to those whose, whose lived experience is other if we typically have access to the same kinds of voices over and over again? Um, I, I think that it's important to think of this in terms of loss and deficiency because I think that it's not really about the overpresence, what I want to call the overpresence of that demographic, people who happen to be white and male, but it's about how that overpresence necessarily means that there is a loss of other voices and a deficiency of other perspectives and other, and other narratives. The art community likes to pride itself on protecting freedom of expression above all other principles. But whose freedom of expression is it that is celebrated and amplified? Why is it that whenever we talk about systemic exclusions that are obviously explicit and widespread in the context of culture, that we end up speaking about the dangers of censorship? Why, when we raise questions about the relative or virtual absence of certain voices from cultural platforms, do we always seem to end up, at least in Europe, I would say, obsessing almost neurotically over how an institution or a curator's freedom of thought might be put at risk or undermined were he or she to simply stretch their curatorial vision a little bit to account for other forms of experience, other forms of expression, other formal strategies? Why is it that we're willing in Europe and I'm including myself here in this, this kind of nebulous cultural left, which I hope we'll zoom in on. Why is it that we're willing to fight to the death to uh, defend the freedom of expression of curators and at the same time relatively in, indifferent to the practices of muting and silencing that char characterize curatorial decision making? Because to curate is to exclude. It's not only to include, it's also to exclude. And so by virtue of the fact that not everyone can be included in a particular symposium or an exhibition, curators exercising rights not only of inclusion, of exclusion, but also rights of inclusion. And why, why are the freedoms of curators considered to be so sacred when those curators hold within their hands the ability to shut down other voices and to mute and silence other voices? I, these are abstract freedoms but there are freedoms that have a very physical and real uh, impact on the way that we conduct our practice, the way that we exist in the world. 
And I want to draw attention to the way that these abstract freedoms intersect with actual real life resources. This is not just about principles of freedom of expression, about principles of access. It's also about resources and the way that resources are distributed. In the context of Europe, at least, cultural institutions and initiatives are often mostly funded by public money. That money is, of course, drawn from the taxes that we are all expected to pay, regardless of our gender or our race or our countries of origin or our other um, uh, positions of identification. So when it comes to the distribution of public resources, I think that it would be hard to find someone in this room who would argue that, that uh, you know, women or people of color or other marginalized communities should have less access to education or that they should have less access to healthcare or less access to, to any kinds of basic social resources which are supposed to be shared. So if we agree, you know, that resources that are communally gathered, that are derived from public funds ought to be shared across the social spectrum, why, why then are we so willing and so ready to sit back and accept the fact that cultural institutions funded by public money continue to disproportionately use that funding to support and enhance the careers of white men? These two are public resources, and for me they are no different to resources like healthcare and education. And that opens on to very directly to one of the topics that is unavoidable when it comes to talking about disparity and diversity, the question of quotas. There's nothing that splits the cultural left faster than conversations around quotas. Why, I would really like to know why quotas are such a fearful prospect to so many on the cultural left in Europe. And I do keep on saying Europe because I think that in places like South Africa, which is where I'm from, or places like the US, within leftist uh, communities, there is, um, let's call it an understanding that, that people don't give up their privileges that easily. People don't wake up one day and say, I, I need less privilege. I'm going to give up some of my privilege. So, I mean, there's a reason why we still are so far from achieving any kind of, of parity. And I'd like to um, suggest that the fear of quotas is really a fear of the loss of privilege, ultimately. I think that we can and should talk about what quotas might mean, how they might be applied, whether they should be applied formally or through social pressure. I myself am in favor of naming and shaming. I think we need to name and shame uh, individuals who are perpetuating prejudice if we're in a position to do so. And this again comes back to privilege. Those of us who are the most privileged and who as a result of our privilege have the least risk when it comes to speaking out or, or saying things which are counter to, to institutional thinking should speak out the loudest against practices of prejudice. So when you bring up this question of the quota, you'll hear the question answered in different ways by different people. But I would argue that it basically boils down to a couple of counter arguments that are re quite robotically reproduced every time the topic comes up. Firstly, you'll be told that the freedom of expression of the curator must be protected at all costs. Well, you already know how I feel about that argument. At, at, what, at what cost? I mean, why is it that this freedom of expression is so, so sacred and that other, other, um, other abilities to even be present or to even have access to expression are swept under the carpet in favor of that particular freedom? Um, very soon after that, you'll be told that quotas are patronizing, that no woman or person of color would want to be included in an exhibition or on a symposium as a result of a quota. Men tell me this all the time. You know, no woman or person of, of color has ever said to me that we would rather carry on being excluded, you know, than, than so, so I'm interested in talking more about that. Um, the 
assumption is generally backed up. The assumption that quotas would fail, that quotas would automatically result in a, in a curtailing of freedom of expression, is almost always backed up by the assumption that we don't need quotas because quality and relevance will uh, sort things out, right? We'll, we'll be able to figure out who the best people are for the symposium or the exhibition or the concert or whatever it is based purely on quality and rev uh, uh, quality and relevance. So the curator who we entered into the debate with, his name is Alain Bieber at the NIV Forum in Düsseldorf, for example, explicitly insisted, and, and this is something I've heard over and over again, so I don't want to pin it on just him. This is something that you can hear every day within the art community. He insists that he's not interested in race or gender. All that this discerning person is interested in is the quality and the relevance of the work. More women artists would qualify for curatorial consideration, says somebody like Bieber, and he says this very, very bluntly, if only the work that women and people of color made was of a better quality. You know, this is, this is really the problem. The fact, of course, that women or people of color or any particular marginalized community could produce work that is comparable or equal in quality or relevance to that which is produced by white men is, is unimaginable within this paradigm. This is just not something which could even cross, cross a mind. So what exactly is a curator saying when they justify their exclusionary practice by falling back on these kinds of universalist principles like quality and relevance? In what uh, delusional and morally corrupt version of the universe can people continue to argue that one's understanding of what constitutes quality is completely divorced from who one is and, and from where one stands in the world in relation to one's social other, others? You know, there's this assumption that this ability to identify and distinguish quality is an innate and incorruptible talent, mostly possessed, of course, by white men, um, you, you know, which is sort of dictated to by sort of neutral and objective principles. To claim, in my opinion, as a curator, that things like race and gender do not matter is really the curatorial equivalent of saying, as a white person, any white person, I'm not racist, I don't see race. Oh, you're black. Grody, you're black. I didn't notice that you're black. It's the equivalent of pretending not to see race, you know? Many white men and almost as many white women claim that <coughs> race and gender and all those other annoying markers of identity um, which they prefer not to take into account, are irrelevant in relation to how they navigate and inhabit the world. Which is, of course, very, very convenient, because if you can't see race and if gender doesn't matter to you, then there's no reason to proactively uh, tackle prejudice and to try and, and create parity. It's impossible to tackle racism or, or sexism or, or, or any form of prejudice if you're absolutely unable to acknowledge that the very markers that you claim are irrelevant or invisible to you are in fact the same markers that deeply affect and determine the experience of others in the world. Governing, of course, who has access to resources, who has access to visibility, who has access to power, who gets to live an obstacle-free life. So I would say that those who are um, affected, let's say affected, by the blindnesses that I've been describing, the blindness to race, the blindness to gender, tend to be operating from a particular base, a shared base, and for the sake of simplicity, let's call that base privilege, right? It's easy to be blind to things when they're factors which don't affect your, your everyday life. It's tempting, perhaps, to read these kinds of blindnesses as, as innocuous or, or as harmless, as not doing anything real in the world. But in fact, I would propose that these blindnesses that come with privilege are anything but benign. They're anything but harmless. These blindnesses, in fact, are, are instrumental in perpetuating exactly 
the systemic prejudices that they claim they're unable to see. Universalist defenses of freedom of expression can only serve to distract us from the urgent and necessary work of transformation that I believe we are, are standing at the beginning of. We're at the beginning of a series of transformations which are underway, but which really still have a considerable way to go. Quotas are a threat to those who are colorblind and genderblind, precisely because these blindnesses function to perpetuate and protect privilege. Quotas are resisted because quotas, quotas disrupt privilege. They are resisted because too many people still believe that we live in a meritocracy in which strong voices, strong work will rise to the surface. And, you know, it's the American dream. So as long as you make good work, you'll, you'll get attention, you'll get visibility. Of course, that is simply not the case. And we have to uh, develop, I believe, cultural strategies which take into account the fact that people start from different positions and are likely to have their visibility, their ability to conduct creative research, to exist within cultur cultural institutions affected directly by the, by the hand that is dealt to them at the beginning. So before I pass the mic to, to Bonaventure, I would like to say that part of the reason for being here tonight is a sense of frustration. Frustration at the fact that we tend to have the same conversations over and over again, and I'm sure we'll be having some of those conversations here again tonight. I, I feel that it would be amazing if there were an interest and I don't know how to define this or shape this or articulate it, but I feel it would be amazing to finally gather up some of the shared energy and some of the shared frustration and to talk about the possibility of collective practices outside of our individual contributions. I mean, certainly everybody on this panel is deeply engaged within their individual practice um, in questioning these disparities, and thinking about representation, whether it's equitable or not. And I don't want to undermine those zones of, of activism as, as real zones where, where change can be made and stories can be rearticulated. Uh, but I would like to put this question in the room. Might it be possible and how might it be possible to develop collective practices which are, are not, which, which can exercise more of a kind of shared pressure, a kind of collective pressure on institutions? I want every curator when they're sitting down to curate an exhibition to, to be sitting there looking at their list of white men's names and shitting themselves. I want them to be feeling, oh my God, they're going to come for me. These fucking feminists are going to come for me. These fucking people of color are going to come for me. They're going to try to take me down. I want them to have that fear. If that's the only way to, to, to reach a more equitable uh, situation, then I welcome that. And the question is, how do we create um, an environment in which, frankly, people understand that it's no longer acceptable to direct the vast majority of resources and visibility towards just one demographic. So that's more than enough. I will say that we have an iPad here tonight uh, in the hands of Miriam. Miriam, can you show us where you are? Here is Miriam. I don't, know, I don't know how many people in this room would be interested in continuing this conversation. It's probably going to depend on how the conversation develops. I would like to imagine that if there's a desire and an interest, uh, I would be interested in, in, in finding ways to continue the conversation in other contexts via other platforms. If that would be interesting to you, if you would be willing to contribute in small or large ways to an ongoing momentum around some of the questions that we're discussing tonight, then I invite you to give your email address to Miriam. We're not going to email you every day. We're not going to take that as a kind of signature that you're on board and, and insist that you come to a meeting tomorrow. But I do feel that we talk a lot in the art world. People like us are invited to be on panels all the time. And I am interested in how this kind of uh, bringing together of heads around a table or on a stage can leak into how we conduct ourselves when we're, when we're off stage. So, Bona? Oh, you have one. Good evening. Um, I 
would like to start by saying thank you, Candice. Um, thank you, Harmon, for the invitation. Thanks, Candice, and all those who set this ball rolling, or set the balls rolling. Um, it's been an incredible movement, I must say, and I am deeply impressed. Now, um, I got an invitation to be uh, part of this panel, which is, of course, not an easy task. First of all, how do you take part in a panel which is <laughs> titled No More Dick Soup. <laughs> if the last time you checked, you had a dick. It's really a tough one. Secondly, uh, being in the position of a curator, I think um, it doesn't make it really easier. I'm not going to defend the position of men today, nor the position of curators. I'll just try to say a word or two, so bear with me. I also just heard a few hours ago that I had to make a statement, so I just wrote down a few points. And it's really also a privilege to share the panel with uh, Grada and Heba, so I, it was impossible to say no. One, mine is not an issue of representation. Mine is also not an issue of a quota. Mine is not an issue of being a token. Mine is an issue of intellectual integrity. It is an issue of wholesomeness, or at least an effort towards wholesomeness. So if you had the task as an exhibition maker to work on a certain project, and you decided to invite only male artists, it doesn't matter white, black, and whatever, but you decided to choose just one demographic group, then there's an incredible degree of intellectual laziness in your practice. It doesn't matter whatever argument you give. It's as simple as that. And it's not a matter of merit, because they, it's obvious that there are so many people out there that do merit that. But the question is, do you get out of your simple, ordinary shell to go out and look for them, to go beyond your limitedness that is the question. Now the question is, how do you describe a ball from one angle? How do you do that? I think it's impossible. Now you have to at least find possibilities of looking from these different perspectives. And these other beings, you know, what the feminists call the situated knowledges, these people, what Haraway and others did call, come with knowledges from different backgrounds, different genders, different race groups, and so on and so forth. So it's but obvious that if you wanted to tackle something, you need to, needed to tackle the ball from different perspectives. So that is my first issue. The second issue, in my opinion, is what I would like to call institutional decadence or debauchery. The fact that sometimes when we have, you know, the privilege of running institutions, we think it's our sitting room. But actually, we have the responsibility, a serious one for that matter, 
to think of the people that come to these institutions. To think of the society, even though, even if the people don't come to the institutions, to think of the society in which we find ourselves. All of us who know that, you know, the basics, you know, if you learn anything about culture in school, they tell you about the three Ps. They tell you that you have to think of the personnel, you have to think of the program, you have to think of the public. And sometimes I've met directors of institutions that have told me, these people don't come to our museums. They don't come. And we're really surprised. And I asked them, but what do you think? Have you given them a reason to come to your institutions? Even though they sustain your institution, even though they pay the taxes, even though they enable the institutions, do you by any way give them a, a reason to come to the institutions? And I think it's a responsibility of the directors of institutions, you know, to give the people a reason. And that is in the form of a program. That's in the form of the personnel. And I think this is extremely important. So thinking of the demographic, which uh, um, Candice pointed out. And the last thing I want to talk about is about history. We cannot claim to be ignorant about the history of exclusion institutions. It's silly. A lot of the institutions we kind of find ourselves in or not were built on exclusion. Most of the time, when these institutions were made, some of us were not considered human. And that's a simple fact. So the institutions were built on exclusion, and this exclusion is perpetrated, is carried on by the people that run these institutions a lot of the times. So how do we you know, think of possibilities? You know, so, so sometimes, even if we had to think of representation, Within a long history of exclusion, one must think of inclusion to be able to break you know, that history. And I think that's an issue. So the institutions kind of think in another three Ps, which is the P of power, of patriarchy, and of privilege. And the question is, or the issue at stake is how do we break that? Thank you. Which one is working? This the room? Okay. Use this one. So thanks a lot for the first uh, soft. Um, thank you. So the idea was to like start this this uh, discussion now. I mean, the, uh, to have a very basic uh, uh, first first question to enter um, uh, the discussion, like to the two of you, like what's your? We heard a lot about different like strategies of those that are in power, that those that are in charge to perpetuate some of the status quo, um, and um, also some some ideas about how. I mean, reasons why. Uh, but I would also be interested in like strategies or counter strategies or tactics uh, to to fight against these uh, strategies of power. So maybe you could like share a bit like your experience with because you have a lot in in that field. So I um, don't know who of you wants to start. Yeah, maybe. Yes, you can. Well, I I, I would. It's, it was so beautiful to listen to both of you, and uh, I would like just to continue listening. But there was one question that uh, you've asked, why do we come here, and do we want to come here? And that has been a very central question for me in the last years that I stopped doing and being in public conversations. I got really tired of it. 
and I decided also to leave institutions and not to work in institutions um, for the very simple fact that I don't believe in the work inside the frame of an institution. I don't believe in the institutionalization of thinking and artistic practice. It became very frustrating um, to fight and to work. There was, there's not to work together, but it's a struggle with a, a huge machinery which actually exists since 500 years uh, through the colonial history, through several European projects of slavery, of uh, colonization and the fortress Europe. So you seem to be fighting with the gazettes with a, um, a collective gazette that is enormous. And many times when working at the institutions, I had this feeling. Um, in the conversations, many times I felt that we keep repeating ourselves and we keep repeating ourselves here after here. I know I, I've been working, I think, s since 20 years in this topic, and I feel like we're always having the same arguments and the same questions. And um, somehow, uh, I feel this human necessity to come together in this emotional exchange, but I feel many times that it's quite useless. We need a strategy. It's very funny because before we started this conversation, I was saying to Candice, I don't want to do a statement. I, we were supposed to do a statement. I don't like this idea of coming and doing a statement. Or for instance, we were talking um, since a long time that I go to a public conversation where I'm in dialogue with the audience for the very si simple reason that for many, many years when black women sit on stage or black people, people of color sit on stage, to speak, um, there's an interruption of the discourse and it's very impossible to speak. So uh, we develop, I developed this strategy, I talk when there's not an engagement with the, di with, the, with, the, with the audience. I think it's very important that the audience for one simple hour listen to people of color and then go home. And that's a, a great exercise of transformation. So these are the things that I've been busy with. Um, I think very much that what happens, what is happening in the cultural houses and in academia and literature and choreography, dance, theatre and the contemporary art is that we're constantly producing knowledge and we have the fantasy that the knowledge that we produce in these spaces is a universal and objective knowledge and that serves all human beings. And that's the point that I want to talk about, about humanity. And it is not. We have a long history of acquisition of knowledge that is nothing else but the simple reproduction of power asymmetries. The knowledge that is produced being in the white cube, in the black box, in the theater or in the academia, in the seminar, is um, um, is a is the reproduction or the mirror of the political and power relations in society. So, what is called as objective, universal, and to serve to the humanity is actually again um, serving a minority that is in power and in privilege. So, I think this is something very important to have in mind, and that took me. I think, and in, in, in this idea would take me to another point, which is um, how we, in these institutions, uh, create constantly, I'm sorry, create constantly um, a very um, violent equation, which is how in these institutions, through who is chosen to be there, who is creating, who is inviting to be part of, who is commissioned, who receives money, who is awarded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we create a sense of the human condition. What we create is that we, it is selected a group of people which, since 500 years, have access 
to structures, to institutions, and that again confirm the condition of humanity. So whiteness becomes something that is blind and not named. Race, genders are not named because indeed, for those who are in power, they do not matter. That's why it's not important to talk about it, because for those who have identities in privilege and in power position, it does not matter indeed. Um, and exactly this moment is the moment when these categories of power become um, synonymous of the human condition and of humanity. And I think this is exactly what we have always to think and rethink again and again. Um, how we, through our programs and through our agendas and through the publications and through the commissions and the awards and etc., recreate what is, has been since 500 years considered as the human condition and who is indeed human. And then, then there's the other exhibitions in the Black History Month when we are invited, or the special gender and transgender and intersexual and whatever small exhibition that is, uh, that is created for that specific group that is outside humanity. And when we create these at the level of the agendas and at the level of curricula, I think it is extremely violent. And... Um, it is very, very violent. Um, and it is a violence that is performed constantly and unconsciously almost because that's the danger of racism that is able to naturalize, to, to create a normativity of violence, uh, which is not normal. Um, but it becomes part of our normal everyday lives because it has this capacity. Racism is a virus that is always actualizing itself and uh, making itself invisible and, and in order to be performed constantly and to always tell us who is human and who is not. Um, this violence, for me, is what should be at the very center of our conversations. That's why, I, coming back to the beginning of the conversation, many times I thought, oh, it's useless to work at university and to, to work with this group of students who have the privilege or the small privilege of being inside uh, the seminars on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, I don't believe in it anymore. I don't believe in having thousand meetings with mentors and canons and presidents um, because it is such a violent and enormous, majestic structure um, that I think sometimes it's more effective to do the work and to expose the work outside and to give another image and another narrative of what humanity is. That's what I've been very busy with. Tough act to follow. Um, I believe I'm here really to ask more questions <laughs> than to provide any, any um, insight in the sense that um, as an artist, I find myself um, completely at, at a loss at this point uh, in regards to the complicity that we are um, all taking part in and, and that we can't kid ourselves anymore. Um, we can't kid ourselves that we're pretending to break these structures. We can't kid ourselves that we're pretending to reach out <laughs> to the rest of the world. Um, and we can't pretend that we're doing enough because we're not. Um, and this is something that I'm grappling with as an individual, as an artist. What, what does my work do, really? Um, and at, 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 in, in many ways, I, I almost want to walk away from it because of that nagging frustration. And on an institutional level, it reinforces these same structures that we're asking these questions and we're having these conversations over and over again, like you're saying. 
Um, and I don't, I don't really know in the face of what we're experiencing today and we're seeing the tilt in the politics that are occurring today and the proof that none of this has worked. This strategy does not work. And so when you talk about strategies of addressing institutions and these systemic exclusions and disparities, um, what I'm not, I'm not really sure what we can do, but we, we obviously need to be asking this question. And we need to be asking, how can we do it differently? Um, how, can we, how can we utilize those institutions against themselves and completely break them apart? Because that's what we have to be doing. We can't pretend to be sitting here and have these leftist politics that are no longer really leftist politics. Um, and having these politics that are no longer really um, counteracting the very kind of presence of the racism um, and the inequality. Um, it's not work. It's simply not working. Um, so, Candace, I, I, I agree with you that we really do need to point fingers. We really do need to kind of provoke at this point. We need to step out of our comfort zones because all of us here are part of a system of privilege. We're all privileged. And we're all speaking on the behalf of others, even when we pretend to kind of give them a voice. Um, and so really my big question and, and my reason, and I thank you for, for inviting me to be here, but my, my main reason for, for agreeing to come is to really to understand collectively, can we really come up with an alternative? Um, can we really kind of push and provoke, or are we going to sit here and reinforce the same conversations that we've been having over and over again? Um, if I may say something, um, I do, I mean, I've heard this a couple of times, you know, about leaving comfort zones and so on and so forth. It might be true for some people, but a lot of us, in certain societies, we do need comfort zones. We do need safe spaces. You know, I, I need a safe space in Berlin. It's a, it's a bare fact, you know. When, so to answer your question, in my opinion, we need to create our own spaces. We need to create our own spaces in which we feel safe, in which we can, we can do the discourses. We can bring in the bodies to perform certain knowledges that we think are important. We need to create our own spaces, you know, where there is not necessarily somebody, a brutal standing behind you. So I really think we need safe spaces on the one hand. But what we also have to do on two levels is one, we have to engage radically in acts of relaxification. We need to, to question that which exists and give new meaning to it. It's a daunting task, you know, but I cannot afford myself the privilege not to do that. First and foremost, because I have two children and I want I don't want them to grow in a place and ask the question, what did you not do or what did you do? So what I will do and others around me is to engage in this act of relaxification, you know, giving new meaning. The second task is, of course, to create new notions, new words, new concepts, new spaces. You know, and I think, you know, as Grada said, you know, the question at stake, which is very important, is again about humanity. And we, we are living in a time when, you know, the United States can afford to get out of the, you know, uh, the, the treaty of, you know, human rights, whatever, because it criticized the United States for keeping children at the border. 
for, for separating 3,000 kids from their parents, then we must take that as an opportunity to question what humanity is. What are we actually talking about? And if that is the question, then we must give new meaning to it. Or we find another concept that will accommodate you and me. And you, you, you. So I think that is the task we are engaged in. I, I couldn't care less about some institutions out there. But we will create our own institutions and do what we have to do. Thank you. Just because it makes the life of the moderator easier, I try to like, detect some, some contradictions. So, like when, because you were like um, somehow understandably like expressing that you're fed up with institutions, right? When you're speaking uh, as someone who is like directing or founded uh, an important institution. So, um, what do we mean by institutions? Do we, uh, do, should we maybe also get beyond the understanding of an institution as brick and mortar, or how is it called? Like build institutions. Shouldn't we talk about institutions as infrastructures? I mean, marriage, trade unions, you know, they are like pressure. I'm thinking about what you said about quotas. How do you change the behavior of people in institutions? Not in the old way maybe of like getting into an institution, working your way up until you uh, also fucked or so. But uh, of course there is a, uh, uh, something wonderful about creating your own institutions, but hardly anyone is able to do that. Um, but if you understand institutions really at that with, which uh, changes behavior, shapes our expectations, then how, how, how could we do that? And uh, maybe I did understand you the, the wrong way, or uh, you, you were speaking about specific institutions, like build institutions. But I think they are necessary because they are like really uh, uh, shaping how, how we behave. But how, how do we change the behavior of the people that are in power in institutions? Yeah, but uh, that's the, the very interesting point that you say they are necessary and I ask necessary to whom I yes to whom are they necessary and whose interests do they represent and who feels comfortable inside of them and who is happy inside of them I'm from Lisbon that has is a city with a very high uh, um, population of African descent and I remember studying for uh, five, six years and being the only black person in the department where I was studying. I went to work and I was the only person in the institution. Um, I moved to Berlin with a scholarship to do a PhD and I was one of the few black persons. I started teaching uh, in 2004 in several universities and I was the only black lecturer and then uh, a professor. So there's a huge trajectory of isolation um, inside institutions. I can look back to what I studied. I've learned nothing of my interests. I've learned the universal knowledge that never reflected neither my questions, nor my themes, nor my perspective how to look at these themes. How I produce knowledge could not be produced inside these institutions. I worked in theaters and uh, in the literature field, in the academia. Um, so it's, it's, it's very important to dismantle these, um, this, this, yeah, this, this gigantic, and respectful perspective of what an institution is because I think Bonaventura said it so beautifully. An institution is always linked with colonialism. Colonialism created institutions to classify people, to define people, to describe a sense of humanity, to give us a discourse, which pieces of, of which plays do we see, which actors are on stage, who is speaking, who is acting, which actors can play in that play and when, to say what, to become whom. You know, these are, these are very important questions. So I'm totally against romanticizing institutions. Fuck them all, to be serious. I'm very much interested on doing my own shit. And if my, to do my things, to create my knowledge and to produce my knowledge, my visuality, my narratives, my, my work, 
I work in alliance with people who elevate these, even if we create institutions, but these institutions that we're talking about, uh, or these spaces or platforms that we're talking about, are not related with the colonial institutions. And this is what we have to dismantle. Uh, we have to create, I completely agree, and I think it's so important always to remember that. We, many of us, need places of comfort because we live all our lives in places of discomfort, of violence, as I said before. We work within violence. I remember when I came to Germany uh, to do this PhD with a scholarship from the government, I was... I had a lot of people that started walking with me. I've missed all of them. All of them felt one after the other. Um, I remember, I, I actually am one of the few that are still there. People fall. They, it's very difficult to walk this path because it is a path of violence and most of us cannot resist. You cannot work. Um, it is important to create these, these places, these platforms where we have our own concept of what an institution can be and what a knowledge production can be, what visuality can be, what narrative, the new languages. And this is for me what is urgent. That's also why many times I said, I don't go public anymore. I don't want to have these boring discussions again and having that person asking that question again, oh, schon wieder, and so on and so on. Um, because I'm very, I'm very passionate and very happy to do my own thing. And I don't want to spend time with other things. I want to work with people that make me feel happy and that are growing a new language with me and that I can exchange, and that's what matters. And I think that's a very important strategy. Um, during the time I was lecturing here at the Humboldt University for many years, I had all these beautiful students, and this was really the focus, that we come together, that we sit together, that we have a coffee after the seminar together, that we focus on these developing a new language, questioning things, dismantling this glorification of the institutions and of knowledge, and create a new library, new language, new texts, new, new choreographies. That's what we were dealing with. And I think this is um, very much what we have to focus on. throw a, a question out there um, because I think um, in, in a way I think it's also a luxury to be able to, to retreat that way. Um, I, I guess the question is when we're talking about institutions, what kinds of institutions are we talking about? Of course it's incredibly important to have safe spaces um, and I don't think that those are in, in, in conflict with each other. Um, but it's also I think the frustration of, of this conversation is, is the limited scope in which we, and, and how we kind of conceptualize the far-reaching arms of, institu of institution, whatever, whatever that may be. Because this is not just, you know, we're not talking about racism and cultural disparity in Europe. What happens here affects elsewhere. I mean, I happen to come from a country where it's almost impossible to speak out without being detained. Right, and that's a very different level of awareness of this freedom of speech. Whose freedom of speech are we talking about, right? And what does freedom of speech re really mean? Is it just the ability to speak your mind, whatever it is that you wanna say, or is it the ability to speak without being violently detained, right? Those are very different things. And, and, and in the context of culture, we really have to understand that all of that is relevant, right? We're not just talking about the privilege of living and being in Europe. Um, you know, when you go to the Biennales, it's not just European voices and it's not just European issues. So we really need to have kind of a, of a broader viewpoint on what these impacts of these institutions really are. And I think that's a very difficult conversation to have because it's so, it's so abstract. Um, 
but but there is a necessity to engage it. Um, how? So for me, I, I think when I when I use the word institution, I'm speaking about a node of power. I'm speaking about um, a node, a node, -E, a node of power, a, a, a an accumulation of power and resources, which, um, rightly speaking, because institutions, I'm, I'm not talking about private institutions. I'm talking about state-funded institutions or public institutions. Uh, should, I think, um, aspire to, uh, to sharing that power and those resources. And while I completely um, agree with, with what Grada and, and Borna have had to say about safe spaces, creating new institutions, inventing new rules, new modes of storytelling, I also worry about letting these formal institutions off the hook because they have within their hands the, uh, the resources which make it possible for stories to be distributed and for voices to be heard. And, and just to keep it on a very, very elementary human level, the thought of sort of going into these, these museums, these grand institutions, as a child of color or, or as, as a young girl, and only finding stories on the wall or, or installed, which, which are not your story, which don't reflect who you are. So, I mean, I think that there is a double challenge there. I think that absolutely, that the kind of resilience and strength that it takes to, to build alternative institutions um, is, is, it's truly daunting. And it's amazing to me that a place like Savvy can exist in Berlin, because Savvy is really an example of an institution that has invented its own rules, that has worked tirelessly with, with very minimal resources to create a completely different art community in Berlin. That's a completely different crowd of, of ideas and voices and people who, who support events. And, and I take my hat off to Bona and his colleagues for what they accomplish at Savvy. But still, I, I, feel that, um, I feel that there needs to be an accountability from institutions to the people who are resourcing their budgets, to the people who are citizens or, or human beings with, within that context. And so maybe the question is, how might that accountability be encouraged, to use a gentle word, or forced, to use a less gentle word? And whose, whose job is it? This, I think, is an interesting question, because I think the assumption is that it is the job and the responsibility of uh, women or non-binary folk or people who are not men, who are not cis men. It's their work to transform gender and to, to fight towards gender parity. We assume that when it comes to racism, this is the work that people of color should be doing. Why is it that when you have an evening like tonight, you see a few male faces in the audience, but largely speaking, men feel like this is not their problem. They don't have to be here. It's not necessary. It's not interesting to them. So the, the, this question, I, I think it's really exhausting as a woman or as a person of color to, to always be in a position where you are expected to exist within these violent contexts where your uh, credibility, your experience, your, your embodied knowledge is not um, regarded as, as having a value or a, or a worth. And so this is, this is another question which um, I think is really important. Who's, who should be doing this work and whose job is this to reform institutions? Of course, rightly speaking, this should be the work of the people who fucked it up. up. This should be the architects of exclusion, should be the ones who are uh, charged with the task of, of reversing all of these centuries of exclusion, but we know that's not going to happen. And, and I, I think that maybe I also will try to, to um, respond a little bit to what Heber said about our complicity, because we all, to some extent, are beneficiaries of resources or space within museums which are built on exclusion and which continue to perpetuate um, disparity. And Again, that brings me back to this question. When a, when a museum over years and years, or a gallery, let's say a gallery, has historically only shown male artists, 
and then a woman is invited to, to be a part of that gallery, you know, then what will happen very quickly is you'll have people say, oh, but you're joining that gallery, it's all men. I don't think it's the job of a woman who's joining a space that she's been excluded from to, to sort of stand back and say, oh, okay, I'm not going to accept this opportunity to be represented by this gallery because there's only men in the gallery. Why should that be, that double exclusion have to happen? And therefore, I just raise an example, something which happened along the way during this recent debate that we had, which was very interesting, was uh, the artist Oliver Larrick, who I don't think is here tonight, uh, in conversation with this institution uh, that had... Uh, made this exhibition, you know, the, the, the Pimmelsuppe exhibition. By the way, I think out of respect for your dick, Borna, I wanted to say that um, I'm sure you have a very nice one. And I wanted to say, <laughs> I wanted to say that for me, because I have to say mea culpa, um, I wasn't the one who came up with this word Pimmelsuppe, but when I saw it, I just felt like it expressed everything that I needed to sort of say in a shortcut, this idea of endlessly swimming through dick soup. And I, I, I decided very quickly that this Pimmelsuppe was made with Weisswurst. I decided that, the, that the, this, this dick soup was white dick soup. It was very clear to me from the beginning that I wasn't talking about a kind of diverse dick soup, if you know what I mean. But uh, to come back to Oliver Larrick, he, when he was invited to participate in an exhibition at this institution, he saw the list of artists on, on that had been invited, and it was all white boys. And he wrote back to the curator, and he said, actually, thank you for the invitation, but I don't want to be on this exhibition. To me, that is, is an interesting gesture, which takes very little effort for an artist whose career is going well, an artist who's enjoying all of the privileges of being a white male, having a successful career in the context of Europe. Those are the kinds of, of decisions. And again, I mean, as, as I've often said, men, are, men who think patriarchally are very unlikely to listen when, when, when women or people of color or, or other marginalized individuals speak up. When a man stands up and says, you know, I don't want to be an ingredient in your dick soup, it has a completely different effect. And so I don't really know where I'm going with this, but this question of accountability, how do we make people accountable and who should be stepping up? Because it's work, it's, it's labor, and if you're ready, um, you know, having to deal with, with sort of small violences all day long, all the time, this, this means exposing yourself again to more conflict, to more, uh, how do you operate within a space of complicity without excluding yourself yet again mm -hmm. from the resources which are available within, within an institution or a node of power? And who should really be doing this work? You know, why is it why is it that the people who have been marginalized are expected to correct the, the, the margin, practices of marginalization? We, we have another uh, roughly 20 minutes. Shall we open uh, up? And uh, so please give me signs. Uh, does anyone here want to say something? And meanwhile, I, I look at the audience and yes, one, two. Hello, good evening, and uh, I would like to thank all of you for your wonderful um, speeches. Uh, Candice, your speech was gave me so much strength. I came here so sad today because I've been suffering a lot from all the reasons that many people here suffer. And I have a very kind of practical questions based on two examples that I had recently dealing with institutions. One of them was a public university. I, I come from Brazil, and I've been applying for a PhD in theater in Brazil, in Salvador, which is a city that has more than 70% of the population are people of color. And um, I found out that in the department, on the theater department that I was going to apply for the PhD, we have only one black professor. And that was really troubling for me, and, and now I'm rethinking my plans of applying for this PhD. And the other example is dealing with um, state theater in Switzerland, applying for a job there, and uh, I found out that in the state theater that has 350 people uh, in my job interview that happened like last week, I'm informed that they are very open to diversity and inclusion and there is one trans person in the, in the, in the, the group of people working there. So that, that led me to uh, this kind of moment where I, I was so shocked and 
what exactly do I do here? Like, because I'm, I'm in my job interview and I, I'm faced with this information. And of course, it's my job interview, so I'm so, I, I really want to get there. But I am faced with this violent uh, response that there is one uh, trans person. And of course, this is told, t told me in a way that I should be very thankful for that. So I am I'm caught in this moment of uh, sadness and angry. And, um, but as an upcoming artist fighting for five years in Berlin for my place in the sun, I am... <laughs> I am, uh, I am caught in this moment of, I need these institutions, so how do I react to, to this? And uh, at the same moment, I want to fight this, I want to fight this kind of practices, but I don't know how. So I actually came here tonight because I admire very much the work of Grada, and I admire very much this idea of sitting down and listening. I came here today really to listen, and to think how can I join a group of people where I can f look for strategies. So, yeah, that's it. Maybe Candice, because you were really precise in saying like it's, it's, it's men of privilege that are already in a position of power, uh, artists that can afford to say no and so on, no? Which well, I, I, I think I would say the same. I don't see, I don't see it. It's not for me to say what your responsibility is or isn't, but I don't think that someone in your position should have to take on that um, epic, fraught struggle. I think that I was asking this question, and maybe I'll just say what I think the answer is. I think that people who are in positions of privilege should be doing more. I think people like myself, you know, people keep on explaining to me during the course of this debate we've had over the last few weeks, but you're so privileged... And I keep on saying, yes, that's exactly why I can, I can speak so much. I'm, not, I'm in a position of privilege, and I'd like to do something with that privilege. I d don't expect every young artist who is a woman or a person of color to sort of go into the university and sort of start a war with the university. I mean, if they would like to, some of my students do like to, to start wars with, with, with the university, then... If it's, you know, if it's something that you can handle, but emotionally, I think this is very difficult, especially if you happen to be such a minority, if you're the only uh, woman or the only person of color or the only trans person, it's like devastating to have to go up against those structures alone. So I, I think that, that privilege needs to, to firstly unblind itself. People who are privileged, people who are men, people who are white women in positions of privilege need to do more. And it kind of makes me a little bit sick that, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time in the U.S. and I spend a lot of time in South Africa. And I think that these conversations are much more advanced in those contexts. And, and I think that there's a tendency within Europe to kind of, uh, you know, I mean, people have literally said to me in the last few weeks, but we don't have a lot of black people in Europe. <laughs> Why do we have to speak about race also? Why can't we just speak about the way that women are excluded? Because if we also speak about the exclusion of all those other people, you know, the black people, the trans people, those people, those are people go into this like facetious mode where they're like, oh, they're like, oh, does that mean we have to have a trans person every time we have a panel? As if that would, you know, be like the most crazy, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the point is that I think we do have to hold institutions accountable. And, and, and I think that partly what we need to do is to name and shame the institutions that are always fucking up. You know, one of the things that was said to me during this debate, to us often, was why did you have to name them? Oh, this poor curator. He's a freelance curator. He might lose his job. Big news... People are going to have to lose their jobs if we want greater parity. You know, if we, if we truly believe that we can't continue to exist in a world where most of the power and most of the resources are focused in the hands of a minority demographic, cis white men, then the point is people are going to have to lose their jobs because some of those jobs have to be given up to other people. So I'm not going to cry. I, like for me, as, as, as I've said to, to people, I, I don't differentiate between freelance misogynists and, and employed misogynists or freelance racists and employed racists. I'm like interested in, 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 you know, moving those people out of their jobs and creating space for other people. The question is, how does that work? And I, I think that it works through collective energy because within a collective, people who are privileged can be outspoken 
and they're, they're better able, they have more resources to deal with violence and to deal with responses which are, are emotionally, uh, you know, fraught. And um, yeah, I mean, maybe we should hear from some other people about mm. that. Can I just add one thing? Because I agree with you completely that the onus shouldn't be on marginalized voices to, to do the work. But the reality is, how many people are like you that stand up and, and put themselves or, or challenge their, their comfort, right? Um, there aren't many people. And I don't even know if at this point I want white men <laughs> to, to speak on my behalf and fight my fight. Um, and so I think the reality is that we still are in a position where marginalized voices do have to fight for their, for their um, own narrative. Um, but surely, and I agree with you completely, not at the expense of, of this double you know, um, exclusion, right? Um, so we have to find ways in which to enter these institutions and fight the fight within the institutions. And that really can only happen collectively, as you're saying. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm, 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 I think I have a different opinion than um, you both. I, I agree with what you're saying, partly. I always said, uh, that's not my struggle. That's the struggle and the responsibility of white people. I don't do their work. They have to start doing their homework because all my life I've been working and they never worked. They not even know which African countries and Asian countries were colonized by their own country and how long and why. <laughs> and I know, and I'm not German, so do your homework. That's not my work. I always talk like that. And I still think. I, from my own experience, I felt, um, I don't think it is my struggle or our struggle. For me personally, I think our struggle is very much to detach from certain institutions and to create a sense of narrative, a sense of new language, a sense of visuality that we never had. We have to create our own libraries, publish our own books, um, do our own exhibitions, experiment. We have to experiment a lot, fall and get up because we never had those narratives. We didn't have access to that. So we have, I think for people of color, for marginalized people, it's very much about creating a new canon that we never had access to or where we were never represented. That is my struggle. That is the struggle also. That's what I want to do for my children. I'm obsessed with books. I buy all these books and they ask me, well, I, I bring books from South Africa, from uh, uh, United States, from whatever, and they have all these books and they say, well, it's not even our language, but I translate <laughs> them every night and I want them to see all these images and all these mythologies and all these narratives that are not in the kita and are not in the school. I want, I think my struggle is to create an alternative and emancipatory knowledge production. That's my struggle. And I think that's the struggle of black people and of all marginalized people. Then I think the struggle of white people and all those who are in power is to become aware who they are. And that's not my struggle. Um, so I realized that when I detached myself from institutions and instead of always being um, devoured, hidden by these conversations with my colleagues and everything. If I remove myself and I do my work, I achieve much more than when I'm inside institutions. When I'm inside the institutions working, and I worked for many, many years in many different institutions, you are devoured by the institutions. You are put down, you are humiliated, you are always doubting, you are the only one. You, you don't know if you're doing right. It's, it's very exhausting. And I realize that um, institutions somehow do not allow you. That's part of, of institutional racism itself, 
is not to allow you to complete your task. I think you can never really do. And what I realized is that when I left these places and I started working in the contemporary art, and that's when we've met, we've met in Cape Town. And when I said, I, I only w want to work as an artist, I want to do my own things. That's when all these institutions from all over the world started inviting me and saying, oh, we want to install your work here and we want uh, you in this conversation and you want... And then, not that I was not be there before, but this resonance was never as strong as now. And I think when we create this em emancipatory discourse outside, which is very sharp, very clear, very radical, very consequent, the institutions need this discourse, need these artists, need these speakers. And then they invite me, and I have the privilege and the power to say, who? No. <laughs> that? <laughs> How much? <laughs> who is there? And I decide. And then, and then we can reformulate them by <coughs> wanting or not wanting to work with them. And they really come again and again. And they insist they need you. They need your name in the panel. They need your name in the exhibition. They need your name in the conversation. They need it. And I think for people of color, for all marginalized voices, who have been denied access to institutions and who are trapped by these monstrous institutions and can never develop their work. I think once you study, I always say everybody should study, but then when you finish your studies and you have the degree and the doctor and the professor doctor, then um, you can very much shape institutions through the truthfulness of your work. Because um, I think you can only really go to the truthfulness of your work. For me, when I remove myself and I say, this is really what I need urgently to do. And I cannot do that if I'm inside those institutions. I need a safe space. I need to work with people that I really love and speak the same language. And then once the work is done, they chase you, they run after you, literally, to show the work. And that's also, I think, how we play and reshape institutions from other perspectives. But I feel when we are inside, it's almost impossible to do that work. Because you're busy with the questions, you're busy with the structures and with the institution. You can never come to develop your own vocabulary. And I think there's nothing more urgent right now then all of us develop their own vocabulary to understand their own biography inside this history. I think this is a huge responsibility. And I'm not talking about guilt. I'm not talking about shame. I'm not talking that these people, group of people are bad and these people of uh, group are good. I'm talking about responsibility. What do I do when I make part of the structures? Uh, which decisions do I take and how do I negotiate with them? And I never said so many no's in my life as in the last two years, and it feels so good. <laughs> um, I think Greta said it so beautifully, but I just wanted to add something to that with a few few anecdotes, if I may. What we have developed is a, is a strategy of a, a healthy schizophrenia, which uh, Glisson said in a much more beautiful way, a consent of not being a single being. A multiplicity of beings. Now, which is to say that, and I'm really 100% for what she said, we create our own structures and then we choose how, when, with whom, we get into a tango. And that's it. 
So in this concrete case, I'm also of the opinion that we need to study, we need to have what we have to have, and then we do what we want to do wherever. And when we have the opportunities, we do the twist in the institutions when we like. So the anecdote I wanted to give is the current exhibition we have running at Savi, which is called Geographies of Imagination. And the point of departure is an invitation from a museum in Belgium, I call the name Boza, a big institution that chooses to invite us to come and do a show on something, the Afropolitan or something. And basically we said, no, we're not gonna do it because we do not want to exist in that circle, in that loop of othering, which you do. You're not inviting us because you think we have something important to say, but because you think that we fit to your cultural agenda, which is to invite in an institution where there are like 300, 400 people working there, in, in Brussels for that matter, where you have a huge African community, and you have maybe two people of color working in there, something like that. So the question is, why do you then invite us? So we say no, and they push and they push, and then we say, okay, if you want, then we'll do it in our own way. We come up with the concept of disothering as method. So one of the things we're doing is to do a survey in Belgium, in Germany, in Austria, and a couple of other countries. A strategy taken from the guerrilla girls, asking the question, so if you are a publicly funded institution with more than 70% of your money coming from the state, in a place like Brussels with a huge amount of Africans and Asians and so on and so forth, how does that reflect in your institution? And we're not talking about the people cleaning the, 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 the galleries and so on and so forth. We're talking about the curatorial boards. So what we're going to do is to do a mapping. So you want us to come into your institution and do something, then we'll expose your institution. We do a mapping showing who the directors are, how many women are in this institution, how many people from Congo, or from Angola, and so on and so forth. You know, and that's what we do. So we take these opportunities and lay bare the institutions. So that's also a practice of disothering. You know. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a tedious job. When we want to do a stuff, we do it at Savvy. When you really want us to do something in your institution, then we do it under our own terms. And of course, it's a matter of privilege. We've worked for that privilege. And if you want us to exercise that privilege on you, then we do that. You know? So that is what we try to do. So everybody, of course, has to do it in their own way. It's a long and difficult process. But we have to, but the most important thing is for us, in my opinion, to create our own spaces where we can, you know. And again, the task of an institution like a museum is to accumulate knowledge and disseminate knowledge. So our task is to create spaces where we can accumulate our knowledges and disseminate our knowledges. And again, it's very important that we also know that because there's also a history of misusing our knowledges, we should be careful to whom we disseminate the knowledges. So there should be processes of initiation. So because if you want to get that knowledge, we have to initiate you. Otherwise, we spread the knowledge to the people we consider important to get this knowledge. So this is part of the system. You know, and we have to work with it. We have to develop our own languages, our own methods. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our time is m actually over, but like we have like one and uh, so just another question. So maybe be really brief, both of you. We collect these two questions and then uh, we somehow find brilliant brief answers. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so thank you all very much. I just wanted to say that we're not necessarily working in an economy of scarcity, except for the hoarding which is happening. So there are a lot of people, it's not a matter of people will lose their jobs because other people will have jobs, because there's a scarcity 
because there's an artificial scarcity that's constructed through mass hoarding at economic levels that are way above us. And so I think that rather than agree with this pitting against of race against race, gender against gender, we need to think a lot about what is happening to produce this scarcity that's keeping everybody busy arguing with each other rather than actually addressing the problems that are happening. Now, obviously, I'm American. I'm actually teaching at FU, so I'm in an institution. And from this perspective of the institution, I'm actually Heba's doctoral advisor, um, but uh, I miss you. I miss you because um, I'm the only non-German in my faculty. And it's a weird position to be in. It's a weird position to be the only Jew and the only Muslim. And I have a name that is extraordinarily white, which is actually probably why I'm there. So I call myself the Trojan Turk because I just like get in there and they're like, oops. Um, and it's an interesting position to be in. Um, but it's an uncomfortable position to be in, and thankfully it's temporary, which is also kind of a mess, right? Because that's Germany, everybody's temporary. Um, but the point is that what happens with that is that, as Kandi said, it feels like the United States is much more progressive in these issues in the universities, but that's also why we have this enormous backlash and devaluation of our work, both as intellectuals and as artists. And this goes to what Heba was saying, is what is the point? They're trying to get us to ask that question. We have to be adamant that actually we are the point and they are the losers for only caring about money. We have to be absolutely adamant that this place of civility in which everybody comes with the acceptance that we are going to start out as friends and we're gonna to listen to each other, that this is what is normal and we have to reproduce this everywhere. So I would argue that the institutions are important because when I have students, when I encounter students who want something from the university but cannot put a name to it and are generally frustrated but they don't have the language with which to articulate that, it is my job that is important to even let them know that that language exists and point them in a direction. So I miss you. You know, I want you present in the institution so that we can produce an institution that's powerful enough to address those students who might not otherwise encounter that. But I don't miss you. <laughs> Fair enough. And that is the point, mm -hmm. that the university miss us, but we don't miss them. So, um, and that's the position of power that I think we um, have as marginalized people, when we are truthful to our discourse and our artistic work, um, indeed, the institutions miss us. And that's what we were talking about. Uh, I'm glad, Irgend Van, to go back to university or to the theater or whatever, if I am in a powerful position. If I am not in a powerful position, you cannot have me. It is as simple as that. You like it? You give it to me. You know, it is as simple as that. And I think this is how we will shape things. Um, many of us, as you said, are in these uh, loop uh, contracts as a guest professor. As a guest, I was for years and that as a guest professor. And you see very well who's inside the structures forever and who is the guest arbiter who comes to do, give a work, and after semester over here, the, work, the, the contract is finished, and then you have to renovate it again, and so on. I don't believe in it. I don't miss that. I know many of these spaces miss us, and if they miss us, then they have to change the structures, make a proposal to us, and we will think about it. But otherwise, I don't work with them. I think... It, we have to be very consequential with that. I really work only with people I really adore, independently of their background. But are people who understand what I'm doing, respect the work. When it comes to institutions, um, we can always negotiate on this basis. Is it the right place to show the work? Is it the right place to be? Um, is it the people I want to sit together with? It is. I am there 100%. It is not, I don't make any compromises. Because I think there's only a transformation when we really transform these configurations of power to 
change the configurations of knowledge, we have to change the configurations of power. That means we can enter only these places, institutions, when we are in a very powerful position where we define what knowledge is or give new definitions of knowledge. And as long as it is not like that, I don't miss the FO where I was three years long. I don't miss the how, I don't miss anything. I love what I'm doing now. I love to work independently, exactly because I have that power. And that is very important. No, I know. I know. I want to know what happens. How do we get to those students? Because it's not necessarily about me. My contract will end. I'll do my own thing. Whatever. That's. I'm looking forward to it, to be honest. But um, at the same time, I don't want the students to have to be going through that, through the same process of exclusion. That but they have to, know, as long as, as the structures do not change. Right. You cannot. You cannot. Uh, hypothetically change a structure when you do not give but it won't clear change. positions positions of power but it won't change that is one of the one of yeah. the one of the my colleagues said at a meeting he was like we really should engage more with berlin and i was like oh my god and he said let's give an honorary doctorate to neil mcgregor <laughs> yes that's why we don't miss it but um, that's why we don't miss it after 15 years of work. But um, you can bring the works that we're doing at this periphery to that center. And eventually, this is how we will shape that center. I think for me personally at this moment is the only way to reshape this center uh, is to do that, to be to make very radical and consequent decisions, and then to work in alliances at the periphery with different people, um, but not to be caught. I think Stuart all had this most beautiful uh, metaphor, and he said, I am writing, he, he, he was from Jamaica in break, background, living in, in London and grew up in London, and he said, I work from a very, very dangerous place. I am writing from the belly of the beast. And you cannot be inside the beast to write your things. And I think this is very important to remember. Um, I just wanted to add to that. Uh, the fact is that the tradition of isolation within institutions as a person of color is something that moves in parallel with the tradition of exceptionalism. Um, and this is something that I'm sort of very keen to think about also from where we are right now in Berlin, um, because exceptionalism is something else that is being celebrated that has huge, huge costs for us and our people in the future. Because there was this sort of one example that I've actually never revealed in public, which is um, when I was actually applying for a job um, in a German, very German institution, I was told by somebody I was seeking advice from uh, that, you know, there's one Okui in Wezor, um, and in a, in a position of huge power, and I don't think our city is ready for another. This was, this was actually a very, like, low-grade position that I knew I was qualified for. And somebody gave that as a piece of advice, right? So then the person who has worked their way up and is now the only sort of exceptional example. And this was something that, um, you know, just, just felt like, yeah, then I guess the only way is to not be completely in the belly of the beast, but to make sure that you're actually very carefully and sort of schizophrenically moving across these, these different uh, spaces. So there's, that's always been the strategy, uh, personally, for me. Um, and that, that's the advice for artists I work with, to say, Make sure that you're not doing one blockbuster biennale and show off to the other ever, no matter what money you get, and you know applying the same um, to myself because that's that's pretty much the only way. Otherwise, you are going to become that exception, and and that's a whole other trap actually. Um, I think it's a very important point. 
But what we should be also kind of cognizant of is the fact that uh, being that exception um, is not the problem per se. What the problem is, is adopting um, the strategy of those that make you the exception, which is, in this case, patriarchy, which is very much tied up to an economic structure. Because you're the one there, you're the face for all. And patriarchy as a social economic structure means that you necessarily have to disprivilege, destroy others for you to be that exception for you to be that limelight, to, for you to be that city on a hill. Now, but what one can also do in that position is to think of the converse of that. There is a possibility. Whoever gets the power uses the power or not. And to think of the possibility of empowering others. So there's necessarily the possibility of saying that since I am here, I want the, the game to be played on these rules. Of course, there's a system behind it that is going to try to stop you, but it doesn't stop you from empowering others. It doesn't stop you from teaching others. It doesn't stop you from building a community. It doesn't stop you from you know, making a bandwagon. You know, people that think like you, people that work like you, people that will come in and destructure that, those spaces as well. You know? So um, I really... I'm convinced that we have to do a shift from that idea of the of patriarchy and as an economic capitalist model, you know, social cultural model, into a system that thinks of you being there as a facilitator, as a catalyst to many others, possibilities of empowering others and going together. You know, as to say, if you want to go far, you go alone. Uh, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. You know, so you have to get people together so that you can really go far. That's it. Two hours have disappeared. I feel like um, disappointed that we haven't been able to uh, hear more voices. It, do we? Is it an absolute must to leave? Can we extend our time a little bit to, to hear can, a little more we, from the audience? We can absolutely continue, Kay. but we can also uh, not just say that uh, even if we formally stop, there, there's time to discuss. So these are the two options. And we can go, all go to the cantina, which usually really works as a place where people mm. mix up and continue. But like, if there's an, uh, one or two urgent questions, I'm fine. Uh, I mean, if anyone wants to leave, uh, uh, do leave, and the others can, can ask questions. So yeah, we've done the exact yeah. same exact thing that we, we said we didn't want to do. Exactly. Yeah. Are there other yeah, questions in the room? Really. Hi. Um, hello. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thank you, everyone. Um, one of the things that I kind of wanted to push on was um, something a couple of the speakers said was basically it's, it's you know, it's one thing that, and a very necessary thing. I also work at Savvy and I'm very excited and supportive of the space. So it's very necessary to create um, smaller, intimate, uh, safe spaces but I wanted to ask, what does it mean if people of color and women and queer folks are mostly existing and owning and hosting in these per periphery or precarious spaces? What does it mean that at a place like Hakave, Martin Gropius, Bau, Volksbühne, et cetera, places that do make an effort or are beginning to make an effort to present other narratives, but in which people of color or queer folks or women are always temporary freelancers or otherwise guests in these institutions. What does this actually mean to us? And you know, what, what are we doing about this disparity? Uh, 
<laughs> That's the question of the evening. Um, Bona, I see that you've got your mic ready for action. Go for it. Ograda. Ograda, you go first. Um, yeah, I think it's an important question, you know. It, it, that's, 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 unlike you, I do not really believe in the periphery center discourse. I disagree with that. You know, Hamid Dabashi, right, uh, right in the introduction of uh, kind of non-European think, which is a provocative question, he, 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 he said, um, The place where Mullah Nasruddin put his mule is, of course, the center of his world, which necessarily means that those institutions you named are just our periphery because we are the center of our world, which is to say that Actually, the issue at stake is not necessarily, you know, if we are in there or there, but the question is, so what do we actually want to do and where can we do it? I am not sure. I mean, before we put up Savi in 2009, we were running around Berlin trying to do exhibitions. And I tell you, I've, and I've said this a couple of times, you know, Hearing from people who asked me, you know, when I presented the list of artists and they said, I don't, uh, we, we, do not, we do not present African artists, we present contemporary artists. You know, so, so, so this, this is what we had to go through, you know, or looking at the debates of, you know, in, in the Monopole magazine in 2008, they said, uh, Weltkunst is Westkunst. Uh, you know, so these are the things we have to go through. The question is, do I have to go there and have that debate there? I don't think so. It's not the center. I, I don't, we, you know, really, you know, I mean, everybody should do it the way they want to do it, you know. But that space which we've created is our center. We can invite the people we want to talk to. If we think that Heber's work is important now, we'll invite her. Candice's, you know, Gradas, or whoever's. We invite them at the moment, and we set the pace. I don't want to follow people. Why? For God's sake. You know? So the question is then, and I think it's a fundamental one, in my opinion, to have that complete shift. You know? And not embody a kind of a toxic power. You know, it's not just about having power. You know, it, it, you know, power is also very toxic in many ways. You know, especially, you know, that kind of, you know, coloniality of power, which uh, Kihano talks about, you know. But finding power, which means, you know, taking us together. That's what we're interested in, you know. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah, being a savvy contemporary versus being a Martin Gropius, but there's a certain amount of things that you can do because you're offered more money, you're offered more visibility. There's a certain, and I think that savvy, you know that I think that savvy is a very important, and there are things that we can do that other institutions can't. I think that's absolutely true. But the question is also how to create more spaces like that. How do we create also more, you talk about in, you know, savvy as an institution in becoming or as a becoming institution. How do we push that, and how do we create other institutions that are also existing, in that are existing? Perhaps maybe the question is perhaps outside of a binary of, of center and periphery. Yes, please, please. Um, There's a follow-up question. Yes, I, I, um, yeah. um, I, I think. Sorry. I, uh, I, can I can I just very sure. quickly yeah. answer? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I tend to forget things when you accumulate questions. And um, I think um, we didn't talk about time, no? 
but I think time is I think time is a precious element in our conversations and we tend to forget them. We feel very pressured to have an answer right now at this moment. Um, I was born during colonialism. Portugal had um, a colonial fascist dictatorship until very late 70s. So um, many of us followed by war. So many of us um, experienced physically the wounds of colonialism. It's something very, very recent, very now. It's not something from the past. It is now like for most of African diasporic people. Um, South Africa had an apartheid until mid-90s. Um, so it's now, it's, it, it, it's a structure, a gazette's a structure, institutionalization of thoughts, of, of theories, of perspectives, of knowledge that happened until now officially. And I think sometimes it is very important to talk also about time, that this is a process. And this is an experimental process. And we, I, it's, I think it's very important that we do not punish ourselves with the immediate answer, but that we are very gentle with all of us and that we allowed each one of us to grow artistically and to find their own language to tell their own story that we never had. And that we need time to develop that. And I think this is something very, very important. We want immediately to change things that cannot be changed after 500 years. Um, if I look at my grandmother or at my mother still working in a domestic work in the structure of colonialism, it's a rapid exchange, a rapid, a rapid change that from my mother to her children happened. This is quite fast. Our time is very fast, but I cannot go much faster than that. I have to go with my time because my mother's generation were not allowed to know how to read and how to write in the Portuguese dictatorship for black women. So we are the first generation that go to the university. How rapid is that? So time, time is very important. It's very important, I think, that we are very gentle with each other and that we create spaces and that we allow each one of us to develop artistic their own language, to fall and raise, to experiment and try again. Because the language that were given to us cannot serve to tell the stories that we want to narrate today, isn't it? No. We want to narrate new languages. For that, we need time to invent new vocabularies. And these vocabularies and these languages happen, even though you don't like the periphery and center, hope happen only in the periphery. It is those identities which are put at the margins, at the periphery, that question that center, that raise questions and new knowledges that cannot exist and be questioned at the center. So to say, I want to say that the center needs the periphery desperately. The emancipatory knowledges, the emancipatory narratives, the visualization, the voices, the new discourse of gender, of genders, of transgender, of intersexuality, of race, of colonialism, does not happen in the center. Always fashion, design, always comes from the margins. And knowing that, and having this freedom, this radical decision, that's the place where I'm developing my work. And yes, I don't want my work only to remain in the periphery, but to enter in this, at the center with my own terms, as Bonaventure said. I think that's, that's the new negotiation that we have in front of us. And that needs time. Sometimes we make it good, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we work with people that we realize why am I doing this? What am I doing here? And we cancel and go. 
until we learn how to occupy, how to interrupt spaces, to occupy and to transform them. And that is, that needs time to learn. We need time to learn that. And we should have that time. And we should give everybody that time. Because it is a very monstrous, huge transformation. And we have to learn also to be gentle with ourselves, to come to that agenda. I think this is very important to have in mind. Um, yeah, um, for like the how of how we could like uh, support like nice projects, like right, good projects and like uh, projects that uh, support diversity and um, yeah, I felt like there was a lot of like um, we versus them um, uh, spirit in this talk and also like um, like the the criticism of how less men are here. I would rather like applaud the little steps and uh, like celebrate uh, good projects in order to um, yeah uh, create more of them. And um, one of you said that you wouldn't want a white man to fight your fight. Um, why though? Um, I wouldn't mind like whoever to join forces with me in order to reach my goal actually. If this is naive, you can totally say that, but yeah. <laughs> because it's violent to work with somebody or to place yourself under the uh, umbrella or under the protection or under the uh, arm of somebody who you can feel does not want you to be present. Somebody who you can feel, uh, you are a threat to that person's... Um, integrity, to how they imagine their integrity. I was talking to Borna before uh, the panel, and we're talking about essentialism. We're talking about how when we speak about diversity, very quickly uh, somebody will say, but this is a new essentialism. What do, we, do we have to now, do we have to now break it down that we have so many this and so many that and, and, and so many the other? But so for so long we've been operating in systems where uh, ma white male subjectivity has been the essence. And I said to Bona, maybe this is the greatest essentialism. This, this, the, the, the way in which over years and years um, white male power and white power in general, because obviously many many, many white women are complicit with white male power, but the way it's managed to make itself invisible, it's managed to maintain this, uh, this unmarked uh, status, and as such, this is the universal experience of identity. And what is that if not an essentialism, this idea that this one unmarked identity is the one to, towards which we all aspire, towards which we all have to present ourselves and be subjugated to. Um, I, I don't really know how to answer your question, but I think that within the context that we, that we operate in, those of us who are able to, need to call out the people who we work with because we want to work with people who we respect. If you're an artist w who's in a gallery and you feel that the gallery is short of women, I think you need to tell your gallery. If you're working in a museum, if you get invited onto a biennial and you see that it's mostly uh, white men, I think you need to say, this is not comfortable. I don't want to, I don't want to be your token woman. You know, I don't want to be your token exception. I don't want to be your token woman. I don't want to be your token person of color. Now, of course, those are strategies which are more available to you as your existence within these contexts becomes less endangered. And that's why I would really want to hold on to Pierre's question about material conditions because I recall Grada's painful description of how these colleagues, people with talent, people with promise, people with ideas, slowly fall away along the way, not because they're, they don't have something to offer, not because they don't have stories that we need to hear, but because they don't have access to the material conditions that make it possible for them to pursue 
their their creative practices and their creative truths. It becomes for so many people impossible and they end up giving up because they it's too hard. The material conditions don't allow one has to be so strong as you have, have so you know you've articulated how much strength one has to have to to throw oneself back into the daily violence one day after the next. And and so I, I think that I am I respect the need for time, and I think it's absolutely important, this gentleness towards the self. But at the same time, I feel very impatient. I don't want what you've said to get out of this room because I feel like that's what we're being told the whole time by the patriarchy. It takes time. It used to be worse, and now it's better. So I think that within the sanctity of like-minded community, that kind of uh, that kind of preservation of the self, preservation of spaces within which one can develop complex nuanced practices is essential and, and absolutely necessary. But I worry about the time of patriarchy and about the way that patriarchy likes to extend time uh, for other reasons, for other, there's this kind of, but it's always, but things have changed. But then, then they sort of start counting, you know, but there's a woman here, there's a woman there, there's a person of color there. Um, so this is an interesting clash between the time that is needed internally to survive and to develop alternative languages and, 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 and at the same time a need, in my opinion, to, to I used the word accelerate here, but very, very lightly, to accelerate the, 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 the time of, of patriarchy and to, to, to get patriarchy to understand the urgency. Because when patriarchy hears us talking about time, then... We are talking about the same yeah. thing, but I think I'm talking from a different complexity because you're talking about the patriarch, and I am a black woman. I experience different layers and several layers of oppression simultaneously, which are not reduced only to, to the patriarchal world. So it's much more complex than that. I think this urgency that you can have, I think all of us have this urgency and we always had. Uh, that's why the movement of transformation come and came from the black movement. Feminism, white feminism grew as a consequence of, black, of the black movement. So of um, the, the work and the political work against slavery, uh, white people never uh, demonstrated women and men against uh, these forms of oppression. This is really a movement that comes from the periphery and that has been very urgent. We are urgent very much in that sense. But when I talk about time, it's a different time in a different sense. It's not that it's not urgent. I think we are quite urgent because we all, I think every single person who sits here and is a person of color um, and is a person of genders have been struggling very actively and urgently all their life. It's not something that started happening last year because of an exhibition or because of that, or, or because it's something very existential. We have been very urgent since centuries and doing huge transformative rev uh, rev uh, revolutions, and we know that. We transformed the world in, in a way that we decolonized our own countries and give new names to the countries. So this is how urgent we are. But when I speak about time, it's a different time. At the time that we need to take time to develop that language, our discourse, whatever discourse, you have to find your own discourse and that needs its time and we don't have it always. And we need the time to experiment and the, and the, and the courage and the empowerment and to empower others to always try, always do it, try it again. You don't have to have it right. This having it right, that's what I mean with time. You don't have to have the right answer. I think one of the most beautiful liberties that we have is to have the freedom and the liberty not to know everything, but always to try everything. And I want to have that con human condition. I want also, as a black artist, not to know everything and not to have always the right answer and to have the right approach. I want to have that freedom of trying and experimenting and to have that time to try again 
and to try again. That's what I mean with time in that sense. No, no, I understand completely. Can I, can I interject for a second? I've been waiting patiently, listening to this very closely. I actually find, I'm finding this conversation very frustrating because we have right-wing fascists at our doorstep. You know, this, this issue of time, yes, it's important, of course, to take the time. I don't see why those things can't happen simultaneously. I personally don't think we have any time. I personally think we need to be as aggressive as possible because whatever it is that we're doing is not working, right? And we may very well and very soon not have the luxury of time, right? Our voices can very easily be snapped from us. It's happened before and it can happen again. And this is something we need to confront head on. And this is what I mean about the complicity of us in, these, in, in this cultural sphere where we have the luxury, yes, to have these very long conversations. But what is it doing in the real world, right? And this is something that we really need to confront very seriously, you know, because we are participants in, in this world. And we need to address this issue that is, is nearing closer and closer. And I fear that the more we talk about time, the more we're not even going to have a voice. I don't want to make the final statement. I won't make this final statement, please. Uh, um, but um, while I understand your, your frustration, I don't really think it's contrary to what she said. She said there's the urgency. No, so the, is, the issue of, um, you know, the right wing at our doorsteps, that for sure, mm -hmm. you know, so there is that urgency, but we still need time. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it seems a paradox. It can't be the only conversation. It can happen it, simultaneously, it can, but we need to talk about has, both. Ha we need to talk but, about strategies. But that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. That's what I thought we were doing here in the sense that, no, really, you know, because... The strategy is also finding time to take care of each other, you know, which I think we, we overlook too often because we're so much in the rush to get there, to get into an institution, to get into some other place. But we do need time to, to collect ourselves, to take care of each other, to plan to strategize yeah. the idea of the retreat as in pulling back, as in taking up, and which is, I mean, guerrilla tactics is made of that. The possibility of taking a few steps back to take time, to rethink, to plan, to see, and to get into those spaces of darkness, you know, where you cannot be seen, but you can see all those that are in light. And I think that's the time she's talking about and the spaces she's talking about. So how do we find the possibilities of pulling back into darkness, getting time for ourselves to take care of each other, to be able to pursue what we have to do? I think it's extremely important. At least if I'm taking one thing from tonight, it's that. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all of you. We had the plan to open up the floor much earlier and much more, but like having such really fascinating guests, this was number 35, and I never heard that much applause like uh, during during the conversation, and, and rightly so. So it was a it was a special evening. There's no way to wrap up, and, and sorry uh, of the series. No, I, this was meant as a as a compliment. Um, uh, what I took away, nevertheless, is like we're all talking from different perspectives. All of us, like also of a certain power and and privilege, but also um, of powerlessness or so, and that's hence the strategies are different ones: uh, the quota strategy, the aggressive strategy, the building institution, the retreating from institutions, and they are not like either ors. I mean, that's um, and um, because it's not my series. Um, I really want to recommend strongly an event that I moderate this Saturday in the Große Saal, um, because of what Heber says, it's about right-wing spaces, rechte Räume. So if, if any one of you who somehow uh, understands German, please come. I heard some rumors there's a lot of right-wing people actually coming, but there is an urgency. So it's a kind of counter program of our discussion today. Um, there is a danger that is real, and we all know how, how fast it's growing. So I hope to see you again. We, we uh, Thanks a lot to all of you. Um, uh, I wanted to say especially Candice, but like, I have to say all of you equally, actually. Uh, and I hope you stay around a bit. We have to leave this place here. Thanks a lot to everyone working here. Thank you.